case of disunity. It got really, really quiet. Is everybody, everybody checking out what questions they're answering? Yep. That's what, okay. Yep. <laughs> awesome. I had to look up to see if I was still connected. Yeah, when it gets quiet here, it gets quiet. But that's plus 10 to the back end team who's created a sound and video landscape that is, doesn't have any junky noise in it. Lots of good hardware questions this morning. Maybe the NAB effect. Everybody's thinking about what new toys do we get? I didn't get much chance to see all the new stuff last night. The signal looked pretty good. I was watching them after hours go around and gather footage. Just a few establishing shots in the, in the sea hall. I mean, in the West Hall. Uh, that, the West Hall's pretty big, although they've only filled it about halfway full. We drove past it just down um, Paradise Boulevard. Uh, my wife hadn't been to that end of the strip in a long time. And I said, oh, the changes, let's go drive through and take a look. And it it, it looks huge. West Hall the looks like Riviera it. used to be, isn't it? Right. Yeah, they imploded the, the Riviera. Riviera. And that huge parking lot that was in front of the Riviera that had right. nothing. <laughs> you just walk through the dust. Hey, used to be the, la the landmark used to be there, the big tower, remember? And then they blew that yeah. up, and then yeah. they turned it into a parking lot, and now it's... Then I they used to stay the at the Riviera, because the oh, Super Meat was there. That place was. <laughs> it was, it was, see, it had seen better days, but it was cool to walk through the tunnel, and they had those giant photos yeah. of the Rat Pack and the old traditional, you know, there's Toadie Fields, I haven't thought of her in decades, yeah. that kind of That's thing. That's where they used to hold the uh, adult cinema uh, oh, convention, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, was uh, it, concurrent with CES, yeah. Uh, or was it NAB? I think it was CES, yeah. Anyway, it was just a beautiful kind of walk down memory lane, but it's all been scraped and reformed. That's right. Yeah. Every few years, Vegas heals over and grows a new scab. <laughs>
Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are watching on YouTube and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. Our first hour, we answer your questions on all things media and digital productions. And our second hour is something that we typically want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be talking about the business of broadcasting because it is an AB week or the next few days. And we have a special, we have special coverage taking place with an office hours team on site at NAB and that starts at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But until then, we're going to get started with our show. Let's go, Bill. All right. Our first question comes in this morning from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, the sound device's A20 mini wireless microphone transmitter offers such features as remote gain control, internal recording, and encryption. How does this compare with other similar wireless mic transmitters? Bill? We've been talking about sound devices for a long time. Premium company with premium products. I expect everything they offer there has been beautifully tested and should work great. This is not uh, the low end of the market. This is the high end of the market. I think the A20 Mini is somewhere around $2,200 retail. So if you're at the point where you need your remote sound to be pristine and incredibly dependable so that there's just very little chance of failure... I think everybody knows that that's kind of synonymous with Sound Devices products. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing about its actual field performance, but I think it's going to be stellar. Next question. Next question comes from Jeff Francis in Columbia, South Carolina. Is there a way to completely disable full screen mode on a Mac OS? Jason? You know, I tried and I tried. You used to be able to do this with better touch tool, but um, no, not anymore. Next yeah. question. Next question comes to us from Jacob Goodnight in Indianapolis, Indiana. Netflix, Netflix, easy for me to say, had their second live event last night, the Love is Blind finale. After being delayed over an hour, they canceled the live stream altogether, pivoting to video on demand. What could have caused this stream failure on such a large scale? Go ahead, Jason. I mean, any part of the chain, right? It could have been as simple as a CDN issue, or they they could have just, you know, underslung their mark, or um, they could have had encoder issues. I mean, just about anything we've talked about for the last three years could have gotten in the way. It's hard to tell. Grant? Yeah, it's interesting. They they The first live stream they did was the uh, Chris Rock um, uh, comedy special and by all accounts i think it worked perfectly fine and they would have had millions of people watching and they had no problems so uh i wonder if there might have been something less technical um as an issue they could have production issues they could have had something that was happening um before it even got to a technical issue um and so because i think otherwise we would have heard a lot more uh of c complaints about that it started and then stopped or, but it was just that it was delayed. Something else was going on there that wasn't quite right. So who knows when you're dealing with celebrities, there could have been someone that was causing a problem. That's a great perspective because I know that my timeline was going bananas with the audience, really friends that are watching and waiting for the grand finale. So you bringing that into play might be very possible. Sky. Well, on Broadway, you do have stand-ins because of that exact issue. You, the show must go on. And so there, there very likely could be a, a human element in this, that they were not able to do the performance. I was recognizing that Netflix is a based on video on demand, but the, the audience and the way we consume things, I, they were early days recognizing that sports was a grab your attention now for a live event so that they're experimenting into that, that market. Uh, this is not helping their trust level with, with their consumers. Good call. Courtney. Yeah, I think Sky so. may have gotten it right there that, uh, they're used to, you know, their subscriber base is video on demand so that they're not used to having to serve up millions of connections simultaneously at the same moment in real time. And so uh, a live show means across all time zones, everybody's going to be bombing that uh, distribution point at the same time. So, And couple that with somebody who tries to do a DDoS attack on that particular node at the same time, you know, uh, one of their competitors could have, you know, I'm not saying, but, but you <laughs> anything's <say. laughs> possible when they, they announce something that far ahead and they're not prepared for, for that level of contact at the same time. It's kind of like when Apple did their first streams of the, 
the their uh, um, digital conference uh, for the first time, and it just got so bogged down. They tried to stream it in quick time, and it was not good. Go ahead, John. Live is hard, and there's tons of variables to consider. And note that. 90% of your audience is going to watch on demand anyway over live, just like office hours. 90% of our audience watches on demand on YouTube. I do definitely like the live is hard in the on demand part, but specifically with this audience being for the most part from what I've seen as women and the conversations around these kind of shows that take place on social media platforms like Twitter, they are very much a live this was the finale kind of moment so i'm um, just putting that into adding that to to the pot as well that as courtney said like all of those connections at all at you know one time it's very possible but we'll, we'll see if any news comes out in the next couple of days next question next one comes to us from tlaloc lopez waterman in atlanta georgia and tlaloc says what does the panel think of black magic's edition of simpty 2110 to some of its gear sky well, Simpty is not a specific brand. It is not beholden to a specific Panasonic or Sony or Canon. And so consequently, to have Blackmagic join in a community of, of technologists to uh, come up with a, a new standard for the new technologies, I think it's brilliant. And earlier, you know, Bill's already pointing out the quality level of pieces of equipment, the premium is, is uh, what people are expecting. And so consequently, to have... Uh, a tool that we've all been using and opening up their their standards to what Aerie and all of the uh, other manufacturers are doing, I think is a great idea. Courtney? Yeah, by starting with their deck link cards, which is what they did for 2110. They have two, two, or, two or three 2110s, one optical, one, one Ethernet uh, set. Uh, for deck links that you can have two or four inputs and outputs simultaneously um, is a good way to dip their toe in. And then next, I think they will add it to their switchers uh, eventually. But once they get uh, the deck link cards are good to just jump into that network uh, IP based video domain and to get their signals in and out off that network um, with those plug in cards that will plug into any uh, PC is a, is a great way to start. Go ahead, John. I think I think it's fantastic. We've been waiting a long time. The foreshadowing's been there because Black Magic has been sponsoring Sempty uh, events for the last two years, so we knew we knew it was coming, and I uh, look forward to it. And Grant, I thought it was interesting the way it was announced. Uh, Grant really just was like, "Okay, here it is," and it, and there was no introduction to it. There was no like, "Okay, big fanfare around we're moving into a, a whole new area." It was just like, "Okay, here it is," and enjoy. I I, I likewise think that decklink uh, doing decklink cards means that it enters into an existing ecosystem, particularly for graphic systems. You know, the, there's a whole bunch of systems that you'll just instantly be able to put a card in, and now all your graphics overlay will be in twenty one ten. And and then having the camera converter, um, I think it was interesting that they didn't do 4K and that they're really just talking about three times 1080 uh, over one t uh, 10 gig line, which is interesting to me. That says that they couldn't make 4K work and they can only do, you know, three quarters of it um, at this at this point. And so that'll come. I think it also means that NDI is dead for for. Um, for black magic gear at least um they've chosen their team with 10 uh 2110 and so i think that's going to make a big shift uh, in the industry as we see that going forward so i'm quite excited about it oliver yeah so um of course i'm i'm very excited uh because you know our product Nemo life will get benefits like uh adding 20, 2110 without any effort through the decklink cards uh which is which is you know, great. Um, I'm not a big fan of 2110, though, and I don't think it's replacing NDI or I think both have their uses. Um, the reason why they only do three channels over 10 gigabit is that they need three gigabits per channel. Uh, uh, and uh, 2110 is basically SDI over IP, and it makes it very, very difficult to set up networks um, with that amount of bandwidth you need per channel um, and manage that um, and you know 
making large networks with lots of cameras and lots of um, devices. Uh, because for 10 devices, you basically need an HD, you need uh, 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 300 gigabits um, in the, in the network at bandwidth, and uh, for um, you know if you go uh, 4K, uh, that's 12 gigabits per channel. So it's it's not, not even possible to do 4K through a 10G network uh, connection. Um, and um, so yeah, so it 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 has its uses in the high end broadcast, and I think you know. Uh, some people will love it because it has the best colors and the full uh, full data rate, no compression, um, full quality. Uh, but it has it, it. I think it's it's a very limited market uh, because it's only those people who can afford to purchase uh, network equipment in the very very high end range, and uh, that's that's pretty expensive. Um, and but you I'm know we, we 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 get it for free, so I'm happy, and uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see how how that turns out. And Sky, I want to hear it in Courtney's voice, but Simti, as the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, are you a member, Does Courtney? Oh me, yeah, yeah. I'm a and why? Year member. For, I've got a and, plaque on the wall over there. You can't see it. Lifetime. I'm a life member of Simti since 1980. I know we, we throw around a lot of, of code words oftentimes, so I get I know we have a very broad audience, so I wanted to make sure all the geeks in training are, are brought up to speed. Thanks, Greg. Next question. Next one comes to us from Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. Uh, the upcoming firmware for the Roadcaster Pro 3 will allow users to pair the wireless Go 2 transmitters directly to the board. The receiver has been built in all this time, and they've just, I guess, turned it on. Jason. Um, yeah, because I'm going to assume they're going to use Wi-Fi, which is the wireless fidelity that is completely unregulated. So uh, we we use this for all sorts of things, uh, most of which is what you think of when you think of Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of the wireless stuff that you see these days is um, using that same stuff. So, yeah, um, with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, uh, you can absolutely do that. Courtney? Yeah, that's right. I think that's what all they're doing is they've got Bluetooth built in already with audio connections to it. So I think they're just utilizing that software controlled radio in there and just mapping it to the frequency, the 2.4 gigahertz frequencies that their road goes use and um, just handling the go protocol with a firmware change. So I'm wondering, though, uh, they haven't announced whether or not you're going to give up, uh, you know, Bluetooth connection. Uh, if you're using that as a receiver for your Rodego microphones, uh, I wish it, and I wish it would work with other 2.4 gigahertz microphones like the DJI's, but I doubt they will do that since they manufacture the Rodegos. And Alexander, everybody covered it. Okay, yeah, I was wondering too if like would how would if it'll be sim like Courtney said simultaneous? Can you use it or not? So we'll see. Um, and just. Sorry, one correction no, no. there. It says in the question, Roadcaster Pro 3. I don't think there is a Roadcaster Pro 3. It's Roadcaster Pro 2 with a firmware upgrade. Copy that. Thank you for that correction. And next question. Uh, next one comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. How can you natively pull Zoom participants' feeds into a software switcher on a Mac? Oliver? Uh, well, get uh, Mimo Life Beta. <laughs> Thanks, Guy, for throwing <laughs> me that... Uh, <laughs> that ball there um yeah the beta is out since last week and uh, uh if you want to download it i'll i'll be in uh discord and answer any questions it's a little rough around the edges but if you um uh, can't get it uh, to work just uh let me know and we'll figure it out it's it's not too too complicated to get it to work but it has some some uh some pitfalls so Next question. Next question comes to us from Philip Oler in Katona, New York. Having issues recording NDI from Teams via Mimo Live. Everything looks good, but after stopping recording, typically the audio doesn't record all the way through and the sync is bad. Anyone else experiencing and is there any alternatives? Oliver. So if you are recording the program output, this shouldn't be happening. Um, and please reach out in the uh, support channels uh, to us so we can look at this um 
If you do ISO recording, um, then um, currently ISO recording is a little broken for some things that don't deliver um, uh, constant frame rates. Um, and we are fixing that uh, for the next release. Next question. It's the advantage of office hours. You get to talk to the top person right. and get a, get a direct answer. How cool is that? Uh, the next one comes from James Fossling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Have the products announced by Rode and others targeting the creator community mean that we might have equipment that is just good enough and miss some usability features for our community? Sky? I, I love that he's put creator community in quotes because as Gen X and, and millennial are marketing terms for a specific demographic, with that I was more familiar with that term as prosumer. I think uh, creator community is now the new audience market for uh, manufacturers that need to sell stuff to somebody. And so I think that the democratization of a uh, of product and uh, because it's being mass produced versus individually uh, created has uh, a, given the opportunity for a lot more people to play with a lot more pieces of equipment and or at least fill their garage full of stuff they're never going to use again. So I, I think the democratization of, of uh, the equipment is, is, is a good thing. So uh, it may not have all the features, it may not be as nuanced, but it may get you training wheels into an industry that you otherwise could not have afforded. Courtney? Yeah, it is interesting. They're going after the streamer market uh, at the entry level. And the one thing, this, this new one, the Streamer X, looks like this. It's just uh, one microphone input and one video input. So it's a video capture card as well with the... Uh, it ha I think it has two USB outputs on the back, one and two, kind of like the Rodecaster Pro. And it has uh, uh, two sets of headphones and a video uh, HDMI feed-through, which then turns into a uh, webcam when you that goes down the USB ports. Uh, I think this is around 300 bucks. I have to go back and look at the prices on it again. Uh, but that's an interesting thing for an entry level because it has those Apex... Uh, preamp uh, modifications the you know the the uh, mic preamp runs through all of those things that are available uh, on the Rodecaster Pro uh, and I'm not sure how the video does I guess it just shows up as a webcam and I guess it supports 1080p uh, in and out but that's interesting and it, I think those four pads on the front there can play back uh, little you know shots and things like that if you need to on a, on a, it'd, it'd be a good portable thing for people who have to operate out of a uh, hotel room or something on the fly or on the road and bill james to your question yes and i think it's probably not a bug it's a feature i just remember my history i couldn't play with big cameras when i was starting up so i had to start on camcorders and in those days camcorders were way lower quality than anything professional i'd come out of the audio side of things radio specifically and i was just investigating video and even the things i did on camcorders and they it, it sparked my imagination and it sparked my excitement about it and then eventually i moved up to larger shoulder mount cameras and from there into digital video. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here today doing what I'm doing today if it hadn't been for those small entry level gear things that I could play with uh, without much investment and continue to hone my interest as well as my chops. So I'm all for the low end and for young people or older people who don't have a big budget, getting something they can start practicing the craft. You can change the equipment pretty easy you can't gain the experience pretty easy. You know, giving a Steinway piano to somebody who doesn't know how to play the piano does you almost no good. So I think it's the same thing with equipment. Go ahead, Oliver. Well, I think um, it's always sort of the same story is the, uh, the pro market comes down and the uh, uh, consumer market comes up and uh, it's as prices fall, it's always the same thing. And uh, I remember 10 years ago when we showed Mimo Life for the first time at the NAB. Um, we had a lot of broadcasters come by and look at it and they were like, yeah, you can have that for that amount of money. And, and they were looking for things that made it cheaper to produce. And um, they, uh, they eventually figured out that, you know, um, prosumer equipment doesn't give you uh, uh, pro quality. And so they uh, they had to go back for a couple of years to their 
uh, uh, high-end switchers, but but now we we are catching up in terms of quality, and uh, and uh, you can now have uh, 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 an amazing playout engine, uh, an amazing switcher for about uh, 5K um, uh, sitting on your desktop, and the quality is is uh, quite quite good. So, yeah. And just a reminder to our producers to go ahead and submit your questions and most importantly to vote them up because the show is driven by you and those questions that we see with a lot of the votes up that those will get the most attention um, by the panel. So go ahead and get your questions in early. Go ahead, Grant. I, I think this is a great question because it, it, it really gets to the heart of the complexity of some of the things that we do um, and that, that there are companies that are making it easier and easier. And so does this mean that uh, for some of us that work in this industry and we make you know money from uh, knowing these, these technical things to be able to get this difficult equipment and make it all work? Um, I, I don't, I don't think it's a problem. I, I think that what, what road is doing Particularly with things like the the uh, the streamer and and uh, the podcaster, the roadcaster, um, is that they're making it easier for people to have a better a better sound um, and better image in everyday calls that they're doing. I think that's really good. Now the thing is, if you're wanting to do a band or something, cause I think about this from time to time. I think I've got an X thirty two that's connected. To, to this setup and I'm using one channel in and it's, you know, it could easily be done with any number of other uh, interfaces. But we have, uh, but I've got all this extra stuff there that I can do a whole bunch of in and out and, and connect a bunch of calls together or I could do a whole band or the things like that. And these these simple um, entry-level devices are never going to do that. Uh, and the, the, the last thing I'd say is just around the craft, the art of what we do. Um, nothing will change that. Uh, you can use uh, all sorts of different equipment, but what we bring uh, is craft and and um, and show craft and the way that we actually execute our events. Um, we can do that with very cheap equipment or we can do it with a very expensive equipment, um, but ultimately you won't be able to replace uh, what people bring with their artistic flair. And Alexander? Yeah, Grant uh, brought up a bunch of really great points. I think it's really been fascinating. I've been watching this space very, very closely as someone who makes podcasts and has been doing it, that for a while. When Rode first released the Rodecaster, that really pushed the whole industry to sort of pay attention to that content creator space. And the first Rodecaster console had some shortcomings, but it was a great concept. And... It's since that product came out, there have been so many products like that. Tascam's got their own products. Now, even companies that historically have made audio interfaces specifically for musicians like Focusrite, they're all coming out with versions of these types of products, which is really cool. And it's actually great to see pro level features come down into these types of products, you know, to make things easier, like the dynamics processing stuff, you know, the acquiring how a road acquired uh, Aphex as well, putting that stuff in that, that product has been fantastic. I am still waiting for some pro level features that I haven't really seen in the roadcaster like Dugan auto mix. I'm still, my dream console setup is actually because I, I like to get cables off my desk. I would love some kind of control surface with a single ethernet cable and have all my IO in a rack, but I think that would just drastically increase the cost of the product. So it, I think the next couple of years are going to be really interesting to see in this space. So I want to bring uh, another or an additional perspective around this where we've mentioned in the past when we have done some of the business or the marketing sessions like the sales funnel. And if we look at the fact that right now, a lot of these companies right here, they have this is where the, the high end 
you know, the high end users are um, the, the top of the line road products or whatnot. And they're seeing that there is this large audience of people that are trying to get into, get accustomed to using certain gear and equipment and whether it be price point or complexity, because the question does ask about like the usability aspect, whether it be those two things down here at the funnel, that's going to be a barrier to entry for them. So as a business decision, what what can we create that we can get more of those people at the top of the funnel who ultimately, like Grant said, and many of you have said that it's the craft and the better you get at your craft. Well, those people are actually going to eventually come down to the funnel and be the ones that if you, you see this with YouTubers, if we, you know, um, you see this with YouTubers where they started with this type of camera, but then they realize the limitations of it and then went up to, you know, the bigger, the next one, the next level, the next level. So just another perspective that I don't know if it's necessarily that they're making the product intentionally cheaper. Like there's the, again, the business decision between, well, what features does this product need in order to like solve this specific problem for that, that creator and then, you know, build from there. So just, just some other additional context, the, the way I, I look at the way that they're trying to get to the creator community, which has a, a lower end and a very high end as well. Go ahead, Roscoe. Well, and where is that creator community? I think the amazing thing, these tools go out to streamers, or I'm sorry, go out to gamers, who the Stream X, uh, you know, I guess it can do 60 frames at 2K or 30 frames at 4K. And the gamers will take those 60 frames, put out, develop things, do different things than the broadcasters would with them, and we'll all learn from it. They will do an amazing show or they'll do an amazing effect or they'll do just tell a, as sky would always say a great story and at the end of the day if you tell a great story with any of these tools there will be an audience and uh, oliver yeah so just coming back to what alexander said so we have the what is happening here oh this is not good back here we already have this mobile wireless controller thing so <laughs> it's just, yeah. So that's that's what's coming. Next question. Next one comes to us from Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia. Rode just announced a few things. Do the panelists think the PodMic USB might be a good option? Sounds like a good preamp and USB-C plus some built-in processing like the NT1. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, this is a, a dynamic mic. I think they're going after the MV7, the Shure MV7, because it has uh, XLR and uh, USB output on it. Uh, it's a dynamic capsule, uh, unlike their NT1, which is a uh, cardioid. I haven't seen the price point that they uh, are putting this at. They, uh, I think the Shure is about 300 bucks. So maybe they're going to aim at that uh, market, and I think they're trying to steal some of that market from Shure for a a good dynamic mic uh, with uh, local feedback, uh, headphone feedback with no zero latency feedback and a little volume control on the bottom. So that comes in handy, uh, and you can use it either USB or XLR. And it does, I didn't read what the gain structure is on it. If you're taking an XLR out into a, you know, sound devices or something, would would be fine. But I'm not sure if uh, how much gain is required if you're running it into an analog mixer. And Alexander. Well, I will always say microphones are entirely subjective and what I like and what I think sounds good on my voice might be something completely different for you. So you got to just try the mic. Uh, I think w one thing that surprised me about this announcement is that this new USB version of the um, of that microphone is going to be able to uh, you can actually plug it into the Rodecaster 2 and actually have an additional microphone. So in theory, you could actually have four you could max it out four XLR mic inputs, have a Rode pod mic going into your USB port of your Rodecaster, and you can have five microphones. I think that's actually pretty innovative. Next question. Next one comes to us from John Fultz in Savings Grove, Pennsylvania. Can we talk about ad blockers? Is there a reliable and safe ad blocker available? Alexander? I can only speak to the Mac platform. So as far as ad blockers, I've had really good success with uh, one blocker. And uh, there was another one that I tried, the John Gruber uh, 
recommend it, and it's called Magic Lasso. They're both subscription services, so you do have to pay a yearly fee to use them, but they both work well. They both block ads and they block scripts and tracking. Uh, Safari by default right now, I think it's probably only a matter of time on the Mac platform, but uh, Safari actually has built-in uh, tracker blocking. So that's actually pretty good. Um, it's better than nothing. So that's what I use. Roscoe? I use Ghostery. I've used Ghostery for a long time. It's free. I use the free version or whatever. I don't know if it does me any good, to be honest. I do know that a lot of sites come up and say, hey, get this thing out of here. I won't let you through. But if I do that, then I go over to Safari and use it and get them not to track me. So between Safari and Ghostery, I'm pretty happy. And Sky? I specifically often will live inside of the Chrome experience and I use ad block. And again, to the what has been said, does it help me? Well, it hasn't hurt me yet. How's that? And go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I use the uBlock Origin as a plugin in Chrome and it works nice. You can turn it on and off. It's mainly a pop-up blocker, but it does block some ads too. Uh, so I've been using that and I've been pretty happy with it. It hasn't... Uh, you know, if if something is if it inter, if it's intercepting something, it'll put up a, a warning screen and tell you, and you can either temporarily bypass it or turn it off if you want to, or uh, not go to that site. Jason, um, I kind of take a two pronged approach to this one. I use AdBlock Plus, which you could get only from directly from uh, AdBlockPlus.org. What I like about it is that it's completely unified. Um, all the way around every single browser, Mac, Windows, you name it, and it's exactly the same. You do have to pay for it, but um, yeah, I'm sorry, but if you don't, then you're the product, so it's probably best that you do. Uh, I use a combination of that and then um, the EFF's privacy badger, and you might think, well, okay, why, why are you messing around with cookies if there's ads? Well, um, I'll tell you why, because I want to I want to mess with and disrupt um, any attempt at targeting. And to me, it's a one, two, the two go naturally together. Grant? Yeah, I think there's there's two things to think about here. One is uh, with ads, uh, often there's, do, there's two different ways that people do the ads. Uh, there are sites that uh, abuse ads and they're, and they're all around and they're up and down and there's way too many ads. And then there's lots of sites that just have a, f a few ads that are... Uh, allowing their content to be free and they're making a little bit of money back and you're not needing to pay for it. And so I kind of have a, I have a problem with blocking all ads and then just uh, taking content for free. Uh, I think you can't have a stance where you do ad blocking and you refuse to, to buy into any paywalls. Um, you, you can have one or the other. So it's something to think about. Uh, something else I'd just say is that Cloudflare uh, DNS service, so the 1.1.1, um, um, there is also a couple of different variations of it. So I think 1.1.3 and 1.1.1.4 and, uh, and, uh, um, are different variations and one is a, has an ad block um, uh, built into it and then there's, uh, there's also some... Um, uh, some parental sort of controls and things. And so I really like doing DNS because you could set that up on your router, your home router, and then it and then it uh, runs on every device. So that's something to look into. Roscoe? I was just going to say, and then the other thing is make sure you have an email that you can just give away and don't care about. You can, you can look at it, and I must have about three of those. So I just want to say my best ad blocking is, sure, have my information, but it's nothing I ever look at. Right. Courtney? And uh, one thing I forgot to mention, if you watch a lot of YouTube, the thing I swear by is if you have Android, any Android TV boxes like Fire TV is this uh, smart tube, which is an app that plays, logs into your YouTube account, uh, plays all YouTubes and zero ads, no pre-rolls, no mid-rolls. It even skips over promotional stuff within YouTube uh, programs, you know, where people uh, will put in a little live read or something you can it'll even skip over those if people have seen it and marked it so uh, it works quite well i've been very happy with it but you do have to side load it because uh, you won't find it on the google store obviously because youtube makes a lot of revenue off those ads and uh <laughs> and they update it frequently you know they'll i'll see you know a couple updates a week sometimes so it's kept up to date and it's a bit open source so 
Smart Tube. Look for that if you need a YouTube without having to pay a premium, and it's free to download. And just coming in with some comments from Andy said Firefox has built in and um, built in ad blocking. John mentioned, I believe it's Whipper, W-I-P-R. And John, another John, said you block as well. So in the comments, there are some other additional resources. Next question. Next one comes to us from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. What booth would you be excited to see at the NAB show? Oliver? Yeah, so... I was, I'm kind of surprised by this. Uh, I, I would really want to see the Black Magic booth this year and see how the 2110 um, integration uh, looks like from an uh, from a, a user interface point of view. Because um, I always was under the impression that 2110 is very fickety to set up, and so. Um, uh, I would like to see how they simplified this and how they present it um, to the user and to the uh, development, uh, to, to the applications that use the SDK. And Bill? For all my years of going to NAB, my strategy was always to start at one end of it. Typically, that was South Hall. South Hall is not being used this year, so it doesn't work now. I would enter on the side that had the either Apple booth in the old days, then eventually that became Black Magic. It was usually next door to uh, Panasonic, or I'm not Panasonic, it was next door to, why am I forgetting who it was? Anyway, there was another one of the big manufacturers right next to them, uh, and then that would start my crawl through NAB in an order. I got to tell you, though, the thing that I was most excited to see every year was that small booth. And we've been talking a little bit in the back end about our coverage of trying to do the same thing. The big booths really attract your attention. And I always made sure that like second or third on my list was Sony because they had so many different products in so many different areas and they were doing a lot of innovation. They haven't for the last few years, but I think they're back with that. Everybody's excited about their cameras again. Everybody, they seem to be really making a push for what's kind of current in in innovation in cameras and things like that but those little booths that you just stumble upon going oh my gosh this solves a problem for me that was the magic of being able to just crawl the floor of nab so i'm hoping we don't give short shrift to either the big stuff or the little stuff as best we can that's a really good point there sky oh bill you and i are of the same mind and and obviously meeting friends along the way in the halls and I would start at the Avid booth, being a post-production guy. So I do I want to see Avid nowadays? I, I think I should out of out of loyalty of, of my history. But I think you're right. Sony has a gold standard. Uh, and also, Bill used the word innovation. So what are the, the big uh, production companies doing? But also, I love those little nuance uh, booths in the back because they're, they're people just starting out and they're putting all their money into this thing and they're trying to get attention. So I, and I still remember seeing the balsa wood red concept camera. So you never know where, where the pivot's going to happen. Roscoe. And you remember how small that tent was that year, Sky? And now they're a huge it operation. Was, it, was, um, yeah, it was Jim Gennardi <laughs> stealing from his, his sunglasses yeah. company. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, uh, you hear about a feature, so like Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve 18.5 announced remote monitoring. And the thing is, you hear about a feature, but you don't know how it's going to be implemented. So NAB's flipped the classroom a little bit. By, by doing these announcements in advance, then we can go seek and say, how is this actually implemented? As a teacher, it was great to have students in a lab where if they had an issue, I could just go, they could, you know, we could go talk about it, see what they're doing exactly. When they would, the, the DaVinci Resolve is free, so students would load it, take it home on a PC or a Mac, edit at home. Now they'd have a problem. It was difficult to, you know, phones or over, you know, yeah, and there's all kinds of issues looking at a screen remotely of a student, that kind of stuff. So it's a feature like that that I would go seek out, and that's what I'd be excited to see. How exactly is this implemented, and will it make my job easier? And again, some comments. Adam said Zixi would be a fun one. Ike said sound devices to win their giveaway of a, of a cute limited silver Mix Pre 3. And he's asking for someone to put the QR code in Discord. <laughs> Next question. Next question from Andy Kokendorfer at Vieira, Florida. Road capture for iOS in dual camera mode with two wireless mics seems like the ideal way to capture on-the-spot interviews. Thoughts? Courtney? Well, it looked interesting. Uh, so it, it lets you turn on and capture your uh, on-phone camera, the rear-facing 
camera or the front facing camera and the rear facing camera at the same time uh, with picture in picture and it lets you plug uh, one of the road go microphones or the the new single channel road ME or whatever it's called, the single channel wireless microphone in so that you can have a remote person wirelessly coming in and then it turns on the microphone on the phone itself so that you can hear both people and a little uh, insert of yourself uh, in the video uh, so you can do picture in picture. So it'd be good for doing wireless interviews. My my only criticism of it is why don't they make it cross-platform? They're ignoring 70% of the mobile market out there by making it iOS only. And Alexander? I think the dual camera thing is really cool. It's far from ideal for me. I just find that the, um, you know, I see a lot of these street interviews and I see people using these Rode wireless products with the, with the built-in omnidirectional microphone. That just doesn't work in a lot of outdoor environments. It just picks up way too much noise. Uh, for me, I still like using directional dynamic microphones for interviews, so that's the way I would like to do it. I don't know if that's something that they're thinking about, but if Rode came out with a... Uh, you know, a handheld transmitter, I think that would be really cool. But as far as the dual camera stuff, I think that looks really cool. Roscoe? Uh, yeah, uh, these microphones are wonderful for another reason, too. They're kind of a uh, backup recording system. Sometimes you go into an environment where the professional microphone is out in the wind, and uh, you can tuck one of these little units down into the podium or something like that. So it, it gives you a lot of nice little options. And so being able to pull that onto an iPhone, walk away from there, having that second recording that may save your in the editing room is a great uh, little option too. And Oliver. Yeah, answering Courtney's question about why don't they do it cross-platform, um, as a uh, expert on iOS development, I can tell you that uh, that kind of app is very difficult to develop. And there's so much that's very specific to the iOS environment and the iPhone that doesn't translate to um, Android. So it's uh, basically um, a completely separate development effort for Android. So it's their business decision probably um, just to um, um, invest into the iOS platform. And for our producers, thank you so much for your questions. And be sure to go ahead and submit your questions for our second hour as we begin to make that transition soon. Next question. Next one comes to us from Steve Bannerman in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, Steve says, who or what influences Blackmagic product development? Anything direct from the public? Do you think they follow office hours daily? Oliver? Obviously, I don't have inside information. Um, it just seems that uh, whenever I discuss with people from Blackmagic, they seem to have a pretty good grasp of what's going on in the market. Um, I had a lot of discussion with them, you know, trying to get them to adapt to NDI, and uh, they they were fairly aware of what's going on. So I think they they listen to the market. Uh, they they know what's going on, uh, and uh, I mean they are a grown up company, so they probably have some sort of product management, and they make the decisions. And uh, there's you know, for example, NDI. I can imagine. I can I can understand them not supporting NDI because NDI requires, you know, them to give away so much control um, about the product. And um, that's something a company like Blackmagic doesn't want to. And tw uh, 2110 is, you know, much easier for them because they control all the um, software and hardware around it. So um, they don't have to, um, you know, they, they have all the control in house. So it makes more sense for them to support something like 2110 uh, compared to NDI. Uh, but, you know, ultimately the, the decisions are fairly complex, I think, and, and there's some sort of, you know, professional product management there that makes those decisions. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Jason? Um, I'm sure many of us have sat down as credentialed press over the years and and talked to people and been impressed. I'm not talking about the people that are like right at the booth. I'm talking about, you know, you got to go back around with that um, behind that weird little wall of ivy where they've got couches and grants usually just kind of hanging out there. And, um, you know, he's got a whole bunch of of pretty high up, I would assume, management and they, they are really on top of it. Uh, Alex has said repeatedly that Grant is kind of the the this kind of wild genius of not caring what he messes with. And um, 
I think that's fair. I think he's really, really good at figuring out what's necessary because he's dealt with it for he dealt with it for the first half of his career. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll leave the rest to Courtney. What? Courtney. Yeah, I've been surprised when I attended NAB and go to the booth. You'll usually find, if you ask, you just go up to one of the demo people for a certain product that you have or use and um, ask a really complicated question. They'll say, oh, well, uh, yeah, John's around here somewhere. Let me grab him for you, and that'll be the product manager for that particular product. And you can give them all the feedback you want. You know, why doesn't it do this? And, you know, it would really be great if it just uh, did this. And they, they actually take uh, input from their users. There's a good online user group, too. Forums, uh, I think, on their website where uh, a lot of people comment on, uh, you know, what's on the wish list for the next version, and they actually listen to that. And if it's uh, financially feasible to put it in the product that's in that particular price range, you know, a lot of times they will include it. Uh, so they've been really good about updating their products and adding features uh, and really, uh, really making a paradigm shift in the price for, for for performance in that level of professional video gear. So I think they're they're quite a disruptor in that case. Alexander. Yeah, I think it's pretty evident based on the collective experience here that they do listen to customer feedback. It's obviously in their their best interest as a business. Uh, unlike Roland, when you email them feedback and feature suggestions and they send you back a canned response, basically saying that they're not interested in anything you have to say. Not that I'm a, not that I'm bitter about that. At all, not at all. Roscoe? Uh, in a previous life, I used to be on the floor of NAB and uh, there are influencers. There are people who the booths know, pay attention to this person and they come through. Uh, I think our beloved leader here is one of those. So um, anyways, uh, just know that, yeah, they there are people that they listen to sharply, and they have been very good at removing pain points and providing some innovative solutions here and there. And Bill. Just one more little note. I didn't think anybody knew who I was. I did nothing in the industry. I had a small little practice here, but I was pretty active on some bulletin boards and some creative communities. And I'll never forget the year I went to one of the Apple events and I was literally saying, hi, I'm Bill Davis. And people were saying, we know, we see you on the board all the time. You never know when the people who are paying attention from the company's side, what they're watching. These are professionals in the industry. So if you're involved in those conversations, no matter what the medium is, maybe you're blogging, vlogging, maybe you're just on Instagram all the time or whatever, the professionals at these companies pay attention to public voices. And if you're consistent enough and if you have reasonable opinions, you're not just there to, to do flame wars and stuff like that, people do notice you. I've been shocked. It, it's really helped me in my career that people knew who I was, even though I didn't do anything to try to do that. It just organically grew from trying to be online and discuss things as best I could and make suggestions and how I use the products. Next question. Uh, next question comes from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. What do we think of the new OBS OT tail NDI camera from NAB? Okay, so I think that there is a link here. I did not catch that one. If anyone got a chance to... The description so in here says OBSBOT tra tail, a tracking camera, and it's got a link there. So it's if you search on Obsbot, Obsbot, O B S B O T, all one word, dash tail, dash AI, dash camera. Then you can find out what they're talking about. Okay, so I'm taking a look at it here. So, okay, so it looks like it's, if I'm not mistaken, and Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like it's an AI enabled camera, which, if that be the case with just some of that AI tracking, I'm highly going to look at this afterwards to see <laughs> to see how that compares to seeing some of those things come in on the market. Alexander? Well, unless I'm looking at the wrong product, it looks like it has a pretty small sensor, which is a little disappointing. One over 2.3. Isn't that like a half inch, half inch uh, sensor? Yeah, and it, it looks like they're, they're just also trying to get in early in the market and then, you know, grow from there. So we'll see where this what this takes. And maybe some of the folks on the floor, I know Guy is watching. Absolutely. If they have any, if they're, if they're there to be able to, to get some more insights for us. Next question. 
Next one comes to us from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Does the team have any info on the new Rode Streamer X interface? And particularly, how much mic gain does it have and what's its price? Alexander? They haven't released a specification sheet, but I have to assume, I think it's fair to assume at this point, considering that they put the the uh, Rode Revolution preamp badge on there, it must have the same Revolution preamps, therefore the same amount of gain as the, the regular Rodecaster. Next question. Thalak Lopez Waterman in Charlotte, North Carolina. An upcoming show will have three to four incoming SDI signals into a Blackmagic design deck link. The card hasn't been used in a bit. Does Blackmagic update firmware on deck links? I haven't heard much about this in the past. Oliver? Uh, basically, every new version of the uh, uh, Blackmagic desktop video app comes with a new um, a version for the uh, uh, firmware of the cards. So um, as long as you don't update the uh, desktop app, it won't update the um, firmware. But if you download a new version of the desktop app, with uh, which I would uh, recommend in general, um, then it will update the cards uh, when you launch the app the first time and uh, make sure it has the cur most current firmware as well. It will also revert the firmware to older versions if you revert uh, to an older version of the desktop app, um, interestingly. Jason? That's interesting. My understanding of it was, was that at a very low level, it actually at real time of boot um, pushes the firmware so that there's no actual physical difference. Like it doesn't actually affect the card itself. But uh, um, yeah, as long as you're running something current, I think you're going to be good to go. And Roscoe? It uh, looks like they're at 12.4.1, so I'd probably look at what version you might be at. And if you're somewhere down in the 10s, I'd definitely be updating. But that can create all kinds of issues, so be careful. Next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. Many telecom companies are touting private 5G networks as a solution for large campuses and industrial sites. Could they be beneficial for our industry? Sky? Absolutely. In the sense that education is now, we are dependent upon our, our mobile devices, it, whether we're connecting with one another or other resources or uh, broadcasting out to the world. This this concept is, is uh, I think, originally got started at the different um, football stadiums, larger stadiums like that. And now it's starting to spread out as they're able to expand that that reach. So I don't see it's inevitable. So, yes, thank you, Jason. Yes, but not yet. 5G has exactly one use. When it is insanely high density, like a football stadium, um, and other than that, I read a whole bunch of stuff on Verizon's resources page. I'm not impressed. Oliver? Yeah, so as far as I know about the 5G technology, it's not made for pushing video up to the to upstream, it's more made for downloading stuff. And uh, so I don't think it's um, a good solution for you know doing wireless video in any circumstance. Courtney. Yeah, I think what they're looking at is it's good for, because of the millimeter wave part of 5G um, is good for point to point where there's high density uh, as a means of replacing wired Internet. In other words, non-moving, you know, not not something on a phone, but something where you're going to have a receiver on top of your dorm or in your dorm room. If you're near enough a node, because of that millimeter waves uh, lack of going through walls and going distance, it has to be line of sight. And it, it, there's not enough nodes close enough together to do seamless handoff like our current cellular network. Uh, so. Uh, but for college campuses serving dormitories or classrooms where they're not moving around, if they're near enough a node, they can establish a good contact and get pretty good up and down over 5G. So it's uh, access to a, a broadband connection, a pretty good broadband connection without having to run any wires for point to point. Uh, it's good for that. So that's why it's great, in, as it was said, in, in uh, stadiums where everybody's not moving around. They're sitting in their seats and they have a clear line of sight to the transmitter, which is probably located in center field somewhere. And Roscoe. 
I'm the poster child for this because when you move out of the big city and out into the country, the only thing they give you is a T-Mobile 5G box. So right now I'm struggling with the upload speed. I'm probably coming in at a lower resolution than I normally would. And if I move around and I'm jiggling or, you know, that kind of, anyways, hopefully I'm smooth. But uh, yeah, there is a struggle to get the upload speeds. Downloads, great. Uploads, a struggle. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What are the innovations that Sonnet Technologies brings to the NAB show with its Thunderbolt expansion systems, eGPU solutions, and Pro Media readers? Oliver? Uh, I, I didn't find any details for new releases, but uh, Sonnet uh, fills a great void uh, for the Mac market where um, if you want to add PCI cards to your systems, uh, you you usually uh, have to resort to one of their solutions to uh, expand um, the the system so you can plug in a uh, PCIe card. Um, in uh, our case, we we like to use the 19-inch rack mount solutions they have, and they have one with uh, one PCI card. They have one with three PCI cards, and a lot of other things. Uh, eGPU wise, I think uh, right now um, eGPUs are done on the Mac. Um, there's no support for eGPUs uh, with the Apple Silicons yet, and I don't think there will ever be because of the uh, special um, architecture of the of, of the processor that is not is not compatible with external graphics cards. Um, and um, what was the last one? Pro Media Readers. I can't say. I can't tell about say anything about that because I don't use that. Next question. Next question comes to us from Patrick Shonis in Little Rock, Arkansas. We have a Ross crossover sixteen in our control room for our weekly TV broadcast. Would love to get control over it via BitFocus Companion, but I'm coming up any empty-handed. Anyone have experience and ideas on how to get Companion to talk to a Ross? crossover. Go ahead, Roscoe. Well, I'm not sure about the crossover specifically, but there is Ross Talk. I looked it up on BitFocus. There is a, I put the link in. There's a web uh, location there, so you can go in there. You might want to get a little experience with somebody who's used to loading uh, a stream deck or something from uh, off of Companion or off of BitFocus website. There, that might be something that uh, we can help you with around here. Jason? Yeah, I don't know Ross well enough to know whether or not the link I'm putting in chat may or may not work. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Brandon Peltz mentioned that Blackmagic Design said 2110 support is probably coming to the switchers later. Do you think Blackmagic Design democratizing ST2110 will disrupt the industry? Courtney? I don't think it's going to disrupt the industry. I think it's going to play into the change that the industry is going through because, you know, uh, uh, IP-based video is basically taking over all the networks, and they're probably have all settled on ST2110 as the primary protocol rather than uh, NDI, which is you know still proprietary, I think, to NewTek. I don't know if they've opened it up completely or not. Um, so, uh, and Blackmagic being a big competitor to NewTek with their you know all of their switchers competing against the TriCaster, uh, which and the NewTek switchers for years. I don't think uh, they're going to ever adopt NDI. So that's the way they're going, 2110. Oliver? I don't see it disrupting the industry because it's basically just uh, you know a, a move from, for SDI from uh, one sort of cable to another sort of cable. Um, I'm not sure what the added benefits are uh, in terms of Flexibility, uh, bandwidth, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, like uh, sending the signal remotely throughout the world and things like that on a cheap solution like an NDI. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll have to see how that uh, pans out. I think uh, um, uh, it's it's a great alternative to SDI, and uh, we'll see how how it does in the market. And Roscoe. Uh, exactly what was said. Uh, generally, standards are not disruptive. They're actually innovative, or they're actually allow for innovation because companies know this is what's you know this is what we can depend on. Next question. The next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. Can Mimo Live be used for HDR streaming? Oh, if only we had someone on the panel who understood Mimo Live deeply. I, I, who, who could? I, I don't who could know that who be? you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, not yet. <laughs> so. Next question. 
<laughs> next question from Dave. Oh, no, the next question isn't a question. The next question is our second hour, and we're pretty close to that time. We are, and I am sorry because I was getting ready <laughs> for the second <laughs> hour, and I was like, one more question to go. Do you, do you want a minute? I can talk a little oh, bit about it. Oh, our, no, in, in yeah, we could dive right into it. So, of course, thank you so much, producers, for all of your fantastic questions during the first hour. And now we're transitioning to have this conversation about the the business of broadcast. And even in, you know, just really thinking about this and preparing for this conversation, I would definitely say just experience wise being on the, the, the newer side of it where we have digital, a lot of the digital parts of things. But I did start in radio and just really thinking about how how broadcast, how the industry even started. So I was like thinking through and panelists, definitely when you're ready to feel free to add in because there's such a breadth of experience in this entire office hours community and just in your experience as well. So definitely want to hear those elements, but just thinking through broadcast and and so I got the telestrator up. So, you know, of course, the, the first part of it being the radio side. And if we really want to talk about it bigger as media, you know, print, but we'll, we're sticking with broadcast. So just the radio side of things. And then you come into the epoch of where television came into play. And then if you want to say like after television, then really getting into like like the digital side of things and undergirding all of these, you know, these um, verticals, if you want to say, are, you know, the, the people, the producers, the camera crew, all of the, 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 the people that make it work. Then there's the technology side of things, which is why we have NAB, you know, organizations and events like NAB to really pull together so that people are upskilling their knowledge of gear, having opportunities for people to connect with each other. And like that event side of things, that's even a part that undergirds this as well. And actually, I probably should have put just like underneath all of these are the people, the people, the technology, and then the the revenue, <laughs> the revenue side of things, and whether that be the programming and the content that comes out. So definitely we're not going to cover the entire conversation of just how broadcasting works. But I think it is important as we're getting into the the coverage from the office hours community, while we are very much tech focused, but there is there's a whole machine that makes this, you know, that makes this work and even thus really thinking about and I said this earlier I said Grant I'm kind of excited that you're here too to be able to even speak to well what was the evolution or what does that look like you know on your side of the world and just to add one more NAB is celebrating 100 years of innovation so even just thinking about the innovation that not only on the technology side but the business side that has come into play Grant uh, yeah, I was thinking about that as well. The NAB, uh, National Association of Broadcasters, um, I can't remember how the acronym changed, but right back at the start, it was radio broadcasters, right? And so in 1923, what's interesting about that year is that that was also the first year that the first radio station uh, started in Australia, uh, is is uh, 1923 in Sydney. Um, and then it quickly uh, expanded around the country and there was, you know, multiple radio stations. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by communications in general and broadcast and how it changes society, you know, and, and individuals. You think about uh, the difference of, of going from telegrams or, or postage, you know, like, as you said, newspapers and, yes, before all of that, and then you get this this big, big uh, furniture piece of of technology that you put in your house. You know, it becomes this this uh, this special entertainment unit that you put in your house as a radio, and the, and the, the family sits around and listens to it. And as we as we jump forward, you know, quickly into TV, and then suddenly you've got this fishbowl looking TV with black and white image and. And people jumping around. It's only it's only a, a generation away. Like my in-laws, you know, they they didn't have 
TVs in their house and there was a neighbor that had a TV and they would go there every every night to to watch uh, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse or whatever. And the interesting thing for me is I think about business and Disney particularly. Um, for me, growing up in the 80s, um, watching the wonderful world of Disney on a Sunday night was a family experience as we sit around the TV and we watch all together and we, you know, we watch all these random Disney um, shows and things and Walt would come on and talk about something and you'd get these old images that would happen. Um, but there was an experience that happened. And as I was driving past a place just recently, uh, I thought, oh, that used to be a blockbuster. And I miss, I miss the experience of going into a, uh, uh, into a video store and just walking around and kind of picking up one or, or seeing the whole wall full of the same DVD or, or, or VHS at the time uh, that, were all, that were all out, you know, and you couldn't get that new release because everyone had got in there. There was something about that entertainment industry. I know it's a little bit of a step away from broadcast, except that that entertainment aspect of broadcast um, has now been shifted into into broadcast with Netflix and and over the over the top streaming, and now we have this experience that's very different. Um, in that I've just spoken about a time where there was one radio station in the country, everyone's listening to that same thing, they're hearing the same thing, and then slowly there's a couple of radio stations you've got to choose from. As I grew up, I grew up in a country town, and so we had two TV stations, um, and so that that was it. And so it was it was convenient because we had no remote control. So walking to the TV was literally either you watching Channel Eight or Channel One. That's all you had. <laughs> um, but to think about what that looks like now, I mean, there is options paralysis that regularly happens when you're staring at your TV where you're like, what app am I opening? And then I open some app and then I'm going to start looking around. From a, from a business point of view of where broadcast has gone, we have the, lo- the mega long things that the, um, uh, like episodic um, experiences that seem longer than they ever have been, you know, multiple hours on multiple hours of, of, uh, of story that goes on. And then we have the micro of TikTok of of minute so less than a minute, and there is something that happens now from uh, an, an experience of of, uh, of entertainment that we oscillate. I think, and I do at least, between the micro and the macro. I don't want to. Oh, I've had enough of watching these tiny, you know, thirty second clips. I now want to go to a a twenty hour adventure or something, right? So it's it, it really is a different thing. Um, the the world has changed, and now what is un what is what is more common now is when you're in a group of full of people and you say, "Have you seen this show?" Chances are one or two other people have, and there could be five or six other people who have not. And that was something that is that is radically changed. Um, and so now there is a business around it, and I'm, we, this conversation will go in many different directions, right? Something that I have enjoyed is to be working in, um, I've kind of dabbled my, my um, fingers in all sorts of different pies of the, of the greater broadcast industry in Australia, and at least worked on some TV and, and then obviously lots of, of online, um, and seeing how that has developed and reaching more and more niche um, uh, communities. That's another thing that's changed. And here we are talking across multiple countries and you know how easy that is. Talk about a broadcast experience. For me, it's one o'clock in the morning and here I am talking to you wonderful people. Um, how different that is to a family sitting around a radio station, you know, a radio listening to one, just one channel. So there's some random thoughts. So, so true. And and you did, you brought the flashback back of like Disney. It was Disney and coming on that you still, I could still hear the chimes of it and the whole family sitting around that and even how, you know, community happens there. And now community, you can say, tell so much by people who are, okay, the, they're sharing stories around TikTok or all the, the other different platforms. So um, very good perspectives there, Sky. I, I love the, the, the origin stories 
And I, when I get my education, I get it through stories as well. And Ken Burns helped me understand the history of, of radio and how it originally started out as the ship to shore. And then they realized they could start doing little broadcasts in New York. And, and again, Ken, through his storytelling, told me about my own history. And so consequently, I did look up National Association of Broadcasters mission statement, or at least their tagline on their website, is an association and lobbying group representing the interests and commercial of and non-commercial over the air of radio, television, and broadcast of the United States. So why that's critical is because I started in the industry in Los Angeles where content creation is the business, the business of entertainment. And consequently, when I was told, oh yeah, we're just making sausages here. I was a little offended because I thought I was an artist, but I, I'm realizing, especially after I moved to Seattle is, no, the, the communications devices are to get an idea into from one person's head into somebody else's head, whether that's to buy something or to, or to adopt a service that you need in your life. So that we are a part of a, a commercial ad, adventure as well is, is something that we're realizing that while we're broadcasting, is it, uh, where are we in that, that food chain? And we talked earlier about prosumers used to be the marketing term. Now, content creators. Again, uh, Oliver has to make a living. So he needs to have subscribers. He needs to have people participating in, in his product. So how is he uh, reaching out to one another with with uh, the, the new delivery devices such as the web? Bill? So for me, I, I, I think Ed Grant did a really beautiful job of talking about where we've come from. I really want to uh, focus on one moment for me that was transformational in my thinking about what the future would be like versus the past. And I was uh, on doing some research on something and the concept, and I can't wish I could remember the two fellows who pushed it out to me first, but it was the concept shift between push versus pull in media distribution. And I remember hearing that and I thought, wait a second, that is exactly what is happening to me. It used to be the broadcasters would determine what's on at six o'clock on Thursday night and they would push this out. And if they and most people would choose from one of those very few pushed streams. As I saw the digi digitization and the change in how content works in the internet age, it's very much poor pull. It's whether I'm on my phone or my laptop or whatever, I have to figure out where I want to pull content from. The number of sources, and this reflects what Grant was saying, is so gigantic now that strategies for figuring out what I need to ignore and what I need to pay attention to get more and more complex. And I think that's why we've gotten into this world of influencers and things like that. People still want the shared experience of when you talk to your friends, whether it's in grade school, high school, college, professional life, you kind of all want to have some things that you all share together and say, did you see the thing that happened last night so we can all talk about it? We were doing that before the show here with SpaceX. You know, that is something there enough of us are interested in. We wanted to share that little experience. Were you there for the launch of that next piece of technology? So for me, the big change in the business of everything that I do in my life is going to be understanding this new poll environment and understanding how to leverage that so I can get enough people pulling the content that economically makes me viable in things that I have a little piece of or that I know how to do or can contribute to. And that's going to be different as I go forward. I'm going to have to keep evolving and understanding how search engine optimization works and how audiences are built and how you get communities together, which is why I'm so glad I'm sitting here on office hours because at the heart and soul of things, that's what we've been trying to investigate here. And thank you, Alex, for putting this together so we could all try to start understanding community building which is going to be the heart, I think, of success going forward in marketing and understanding stuff. Courtney? Yeah, I started a long time ago in radio before I moved into TV, and this was my first boss. You may recognize him, Guglielmo Marconi. <laughs> we called him Googie. Uh, but uh, uh, he started the whole radio thing, 
And uh, radio broadcasts originally uh, started as network uh, broadcasts uh, because uh, the CBS, NBC, RCA, the RCA network all originated out of New York and the East Coast, and they broadcast to local radio stations, which would carry those broadcasts uh, locally. So it was kind of appointment radio. But now it's all changed. With the development of the Internet, there's... um, uh, a local radio broadcaster. There's still a lot of local radio broadcasts, but with things like iHeartRadio and uh, TuneIn, which lets you use the internet to tune in any local tele- radio broadcast from just about anywhere all over the world, at least all over the United States, you're no longer limited to just the uh, reception within the uh, broadcasters in your neighborhood of your radio. And I don't think radio is dead. Streaming has opened up that... Uh, the whole new market to local broadcasters. Uh, so you can now go on one of those two websites and find the radio station that you, where the city you used to live on of your youth and listen to all the local news and the local towns uh, where you grew up. And that's kind of interesting, and I enjoy doing that. So uh, a whole broad worldwide audience has opened up to those local uh, radio stations that carry the local news and the the local broadcast, as well as some of those syndicated shows that they would carry in the past. And I think radio is not dead. Video did not kill the radio star necessarily um, because uh, there's people that still like to listen uh, passively uh, while they're doing something else. Uh, You know, audiobooks fills that niche for a lot of people, but a lot of people like to hear the local news, the local DJ or the local talk radio show of uh, what's going on in their neighborhood, what's going on that affects them directly. And you're not going to hear that if you're listening to something streaming because who knows when that was recorded. It could have been recorded three years ago. So it may not relate to what's going on today in your world. So, And then I moved into TV and TV broadcasters are now uh, dealing with the same thing, the TV broadcast situation, which started as local local broadcasters with network support who were, you know, they had a lot of their programming coming from a centralized network like NBC, ABC, and CBS. Uh, But they also had local news and local programs as well to supplement that. Uh, And I think uh, those broadcasters are still around. Some people say that streaming is going to kill broadcasts. I think it just opens it up to a wider market. Broadcasters now have the ability to... uh, broadcast not only on their primary channel, but they got digital second channels. So they not only have a single stream of uh, advertising supported uh, programming that they sell, but they can also specialize to different uh, language markets in their market neighborhood. Uh, They can have a Korean channel and a Taiwanese channel and a Chinese channel and a Spanish channel. Um, uh, And that opens up a whole new range of additional places to sell ads. So I think... uh, it's still an ad-rich, ad-supported market as much as people out there hate ads and like to skip over ads, and that's why they only listen to streaming. I think there still is a market for uh, broadcast television, live broadcast television. Roscoe? <laughs> and Courtney, for tune in, you didn't give him a recommendation, so I'm going to give it to him. K-R-O-X out of Crookston, Minnesota, small town radio station. You'll find out what's on the menu for the elementary school every morning, whether or not they're getting tater tots. And I love it. I just love that. I mean, I know it sounds hokey, but it's there. It's still alive. Somebody's, it might be a teenager running the studio. I don't know, but I love the fact that it exists. Um I put a link into a book because a lot of the original broadcasting was on paper and it's a great read and it it kind of goes back to what Bill was talking about, which is uh, broadcasting versus broadcatching. A gentleman named Nicholas Negroponte used to run the MIT, MIT, Massachusetts, yeah, MIT Media Lab, uh, coined that phrase and talked to it about. And the, the truth is, yeah, we used to push stuff out, but now you go catch it. It's all over the place. You have to go, you know, decide where it comes from. And then the other thing is, uh, Gosh, there was another great thought in there that he he came up with. Oh, wired and wireless. So everything used to be wireless. Television used to come over the air. Now it doesn't. A lot of the television is coming over a wired connection, although that's kind of changing now again with the streaming and the uh, the, the small devices that we carry around everywhere we go. But uh, the wired has gone wireless and the wireless technology has gone to wired. So I guess uh, the point there being the wireless uh, is telephones now. 
where telephones used to be wired into the home. So there's these quantum switches in the industry and the broadcasters have had to try and keep up and they're doing what they can. So the business is changing. It'll continue to change. And we're here watching it go. I'm going to stop there. Alexander. I agree with what Courtney said. I don't think radio is dead, but it's clearly it clearly has to evolve and uh, they're having some challenges i mean when i was in high school towards the tail end of the 90s i listened to so much radio i mean there was one popular radio station i mean still around 99.3 c fox it's a very very well-known radio station and i listened not just for the information but it was really more about the personalities and I don't really hear the, a lot of those personalities now on the radio. We've got a whole new generation of people trying to do this stuff. And largely, I just find it mostly irrelevant. I still have to commute every day to work, so I do listen to AM radio for traffic reports. But that's about it. And um, the other thing that I find, like I've tr completely transitioned to listening to podcasts. So I think podcasts have been hugely beneficial in a, give. You know, the technology has allowed the average person to be their own personality for better or for worse. And it's really interesting watching this space and watching broadcasters try to, you know, just adopt, do things like uh, adopting video, putting cameras in the studio, that kind of thing. I don't know how well that's working for them. But the other thing that I find interesting is this whole shift and push towards uh, digital AM radio exclusively. I don't know if anyone else here has any experience with it or has been watching that space, but I, I find that pretty interesting because that's one of the thing as, uh, things that bother me as someone that cares about audio. It's just how bad AM broadcasts sound on the radio. And yes, they do have streaming ways you can listen to that and it sounds a lot better there, but will digital AM solve that problem? Uh, will more people listen to it? I don't know if that's really the answer either. So just to touch on what you just shared with the digital push for digital AM, what what's significant about that? Like, is it is there are they doing something different with the audio? Because if, if a station has a digital channel, they have a digital channel. So I'm just well, curious. It's, it's HD, HD audio. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and going back to the technology of it, AM radio was prized because it reaches much farther than FM. FM is typically a local market thing. You put a, a, a well-powered AM station on, you reach multiple states, sometimes the whole country. So the compressor, the that heavy compressed sound was often a part of that gigantic reach that an AM station had. It's hard to listen to for a long time, but if you're in rural Minnesota, it can easily reach you from any of the number of big cities. So you have more choice there on AM than you had on FM. Copy that. Jason? I, as I was listening to Grant um, and then Sky and Bill and everybody talk about this, um, it occurred to me that everything that, that everybody said, of course, is absolutely wonderful and it's true, uh, but also and possibly more importantly, if you think about the business of broadcast, um, that piece of it is always going to be a team sport. That's the real difference, right? You know, broadcasting needs to be democratized. Excellent. Good. Great. Fine. Can I go, you know, can I, can I, you know, go live on my phone? Sure, I can. But the the real, the real true business of the thing will will never be able to succeed as a one-man band because there are going to be people who are teams and and you know that's production is a team sport well said well said and i wanted to pull in some of the some of the comments because there's great um insights coming in um from the community just like you said jason um adam mentioned that viewers that like without the content that it, it doesn't work ultimately the business of the broadcast is having the content or the programming and the need for for viewerships and then the ad sales um so just bringing that piece together and then also mark said other small town radio and he mentions wgmd 92.7 Re, Rehoboth Beach, I believe, Denver, the talk of Del Mara. So I think that's another what he was just sharing is like another local um, local programming and just looking back and this I'm loving this conversation because we're seeing the breadth 
and the the diversity in this space. And again, going back to that word of innovation and how that has impacted this space. Like I look at my growing up or when I was a teenager, a lot of my friends were DJs. So my experience was first and foremost on radio and going to the community radio station, community stations were typically inside of the different universities and the colleges around. And that came out of having in in Toronto, the diverse communities. So the the Caribbean, the West Indian community, the all the different other cultures, Filipino, Asian, and that while there are main channels or main radio stations, they weren't necessarily playing the programming that quote unquote, the community and certain viewers, um, or again, going to radio. So that people wanted to hear. They weren't getting the, to Roscoe's point, <laughs> the, the lunch menu in the, in the local community, that news. So the need to innovate and be on those community radio stations to get access to cultural news and information, the music, and that, the, that business in the schools that was a little bit different. So you had, that was listener supported. They weren't commercial radio. So there's that side of the business as well, where these college stations and how they make revenue. And yes, it's donations, but then there's ad sales for when they do, um, it's not telethons, radiothons, doing radiothons or having people buy ads, like community of businesses in the community buying ads. So that's, you know, where I got my start was radio wise. But then there was um, Claremont Humphrey. He was a DJ on one of the college stations, but then he wanted to do, and this is at the the turn of the century <laughs> where it was like the internet started booming. And I suggested to him, well, why don't you do something online so that he could have a greater reach? So now this is where the innovation side of it comes into where we have this digital and we launched like the first live streaming gospel network in Canada. And he's been on the air for like 20 plus years. So just that that side of like, hopefully there'll be a question that comes up later on of like, well, what's next in the, the innovation and the and how will that impact the business side? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, broadcast, radio, television, it really has created a blueprint for even how digital and the TikTokers <laughs> saying it like that, but how they're doing things like they produce the content, they get an audience attraction and either they pitch themselves to brands and or brands reach out to them. So just even that part of it, it it hasn't changed as much. There's still a need for revenue and income coming in. So that was a lot, but just even, again, I wanted to share on that side and, and where we are right now and how that, the, the niching down of broadcast, if that makes sense, of localized, personalized content and programming. Uh, Sky. I love that. Niching. Uh, that's going to be our new phrase. We're niching because yeah, we're, we're connecting humans with other humans. And, and my heart swelled because Jason completely stole my punchline about life and production are both a team sport. And I think over the last three years, this team has evolved and also experimented and found a, a safe environment to create um, uh, content, but also stay connected. And I think that's what we're reverse engineering in this conversation this morning of what broadcast is. And I also, the, the phrase, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And that Jurassic park, you know, we, we remember that, that concept that was introduced of, um, just because you can, and now we have the access to the tools doesn't mean you are the performer. Maybe you are the engineer. Maybe you're the the a, a different part of the process. And this is allowing us the opportunity to find out what we want to do. Uh, I mean, the, the democratization of the equipment and the, the lowering of the barrier to entry of, of how much it costs and things like that is giving us opportunity to find where is our voice in this. Maybe we are the author of the story, but we're maybe not the performer. Mm, Courtney. 
Yeah, one thing uh, I've noticed is a lot of people buy these new TV sets. I don't think broadcast is dead. A lot of people say because of streaming and uh, over-the-top type of connections to the Internet uh, that broadcasting is dead. Alex constantly says broadcast is dead. A lot of people buy new TV sets, and they never even hook up an antenna to it. They hook it up to their cable box, or they hook it up to the Internet and their uh, you know, Apple TV or their you know, Fire TV or their Roku, and you know, subscribe to Hulu or, or uh, YouTube uh, TV to get all the cable channels that they would normally get. And they never even turn on the receiver in their television. But you'd be surprised. I turned on mine. I have a rooftop antenna and I have a new you know, next-gen TV, which is ATSC3. Turn it on, scan just the digital channels in the Los Angeles area. I get 158 channels, all free, all ad-supported. And um, you don't have to subscribe to anything. And you get things, all the sub-channels, like I have this thing called Tableau TV, which converts the uh, four tuners from that antenna. And there are uh, hundreds of, I mean, you can get, Old, uh, if you like old uh, TV, here's retro TV. You can watch My Little Margie right now <laughs> on your retro TV. And that's a DVR as well. It, it converts those antenna signals of the uh, local channels, uh, on, puts them on your network, and you can receive it from any of those over-the-top uh, digital boxes on any of your TVs in the house that are uh, connecting to the network. Um, so... That's a handy way to spread broadcast TV over the new media of uh, IP TV, as well as do as a DVR. You plug a hard disk into it, it has four tuners in it, and can schedule and record any of the shows that come in over broadcast anytime, every time. Really cheap. Go ahead, Bill. Always good to keep in mind, too, that the business model, and we're here on Monday talking about business often, was to assemble an audience through your program and then sell that audience to advertisers. That is what drove all of broadcast media and still does to this day. Even as it goes offline from the broadcast world, you're still trying to assemble an audience and then present that audience with information from advertisers or from uh, direct sales But the assembly of the audience is the big thing. And that often skews. I just always am mindful of the fact, and and this is something that happened with radio. Radio was once very community-oriented, and your local station knew what was happening, your local concerts and your local news and things like that. Um, As radio diminished in popularity and people moved to TVs, movies, and then the Internet, uh, those radio stations tried to maintain the audience. And sometimes it's easier through uh, more shocky kind of content. We heard about shock jocks trying to push the edge on morning radio. We had a lot of talk radio that was very kind of grievance oriented. And again, I think that's just to make people think, I must listen to this or I will miss something. And it tends to skew, I think, um, the kinds of discord. When it was all your local community, this is what's happening, there was a pretty broad range of voices out there. I saw those compacting and and moving to the extremes, both uh, political extremes and beyond in the broadcast spectrum. And I just think it's good to be aware of the fact that when your whole job is assembling a big audience, the more edgy your content can be, the better chance you sometimes have in getting more people in there. And that kind of pushes the discourse in that direction. And it's something I'm just mindful of when I listen to where we're going. I'm hoping the fact that more niches come in there means that people can vote with their interests and, um, migrate to the platforms that really do serve what you want. And it's not all about what makes the most people either angrier or happy. Grant. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of interesting things about where we're going. Uh, like I think of Jimmy Donaldson or, or Mr. Beast, as he's known uh, on YouTube. He's pushing 150 million subscribers on YouTube. And here's a young guy who's, who is circumventing all of the old school ways of doing stuff um, and is making serious money with it. And the type of advertising, to Bill's point, there still is advertising in there. Uh, but he does these things that are in context uh, within the content that is very different to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really watch TV anymore where there's ads that play. 
and occasionally I have a, a TV, I see a TV and an ad plays and I, I feel confronted by it. I'm like, what is, what, what is this content that I haven't chosen now being pushed out at me? What is this thing? Whereas new media, like what Mr. Beast is doing, um, is context driven. But here's, a, here's a, just another thought about media in, in general is what happens for you when there's an emergency in your area? Like what do you connect to? So there's a there's a disaster going on, something. You want to get connected to the most amount of people at that point. And often that's radio, right? Like often we think of we think of radio for emergency because of how uh, cheap it is and low power usage it, it is. We don't need internet, we just need, you know, an old radio with a few batteries in it and we're gonna be able to listen for some time and stay connected. Now I think we I think the world is changing somewhat to where internet will stay up often even in the in, in these uh disaster areas. Um it's one of the things we get up straight away is to get the internet going and you know have the the uh the towers going so that people can use their phones and there's so many different ways now that we can charge our phones and we keep it all going. So I think that is changing. But radio is not going to go away for some time if if not for only that reason um of uh, of emergency and so what's interesting at that point from a business point of view is when there's an emergency going on it would it always seems inappropriate to for them to be then playing ads or trying to be making money off of people who are trying to connect to the to the emergency information but i still remember some of the like you think about 911 i can still think of some of the australian reporters that were on site in new york at the time um, and that's kind of in my, in my mind as these, as these, uh, journalist professionals, um, that were, that were covering, um, a world altering event. Um, and I'm connected to those people for many years afterwards. And the business of that comes back around because then I have this connection to them that came through that time when they weren't playing any ads. And I still maintain that connection with them when they are playing the ads. And Alexander. Yeah, I just want to uh, point out one radio station that's really captivated my attention. That's KEXP in Seattle. Somebody turned me on to them, and I tend to <laughs> see skies. <laughs> um, they, I'm, I tend to be stuck in my ways with music. I don't really discover a lot of new bands, and their YouTube channel. I think they're doing something incredibly unique. They have a really cool studio really good production and they seem to have built a really a much larger global audience and that's something i think a lot of radio stations need to pay more attention to i think they're doing a good job all right bill let's get into these questions absolutely our first one comes from dave troutman in edmonton canada why do you think radio was still in the studio and not live in the field most of the time go ahead roscoe well, two reasons. One is just the noise that uh, you can avoid by being in a nice, quiet environment. But secondarily, it's, it's a personnel costs money. And a lot of these studios are not operating with any kind of a crew. Uh, well, I shouldn't say a field crew. They're operating with maybe one or two people at a location. Uh, oftentimes, the engineer is borrowed. Uh, we need Bob to come over and you know fix the antenna on the mountain. Can he get it in his pickup truck and go take care of that? He's not there all the time. So they're such a small operation that they really just can't go. They have to stay and take the phone calls or whatever else they need to do in one location. Courtney? Uh, yeah, things have changed quite a bit in uh, radio broadcasting because uh, uh, music radio is a lot of it is automated. Even the, even the, it's what sounds like a live disc jockey is canned and uh, those inserts are all programmed by a computer, lead-ins to the songs, etc. It's all running off a computer and uh, Live radio is more. You'll find it more in the in the range of news radio and uh, 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 entertainment radio. In other words, talk radio, uh, where they're not playing any music. They're just talking about current events, news events, local events, etc. And they won't have news reporters in the field because the main main reason for field reporters was for traffic coverage, and a lot of that can now be done with with the internet and uh, all the local. Your metropolitan areas, they all have traffic cams that are permanently mounted out there that you can access on your 
on any computer or phone, so you can see what the traffic is. You can go to Google Maps. It'll have live traffic superimposed on your route to the location and take all that into account. So there's not that much need for a traffic reporter to let you know where the accidents are in your neighborhood if you're commuting or traveling. Um, and the field reporters for news, they just can't afford them anymore. Um, you know, the local television stations do a good job of that, and because of the democratization of video, it can now be a person with just a phone out there who can file a report who happens to be at a location of a, some news event, a car crash or, a, God forbid, a shooting or something. Uh, you'll see 20 people uploading the videos from their phones that they shot on the location. The local news channels can cut to any of that footage without having to pay a, a stringer or a, or a reporter in the field or... And uh, they will eventually send a reporter to the field if it's going to if the event is going ongoing. So uh, during that period of time, they take a lot of submissions from the public. So you don't see as many uh, news reporters in the field because it gets just too expensive. I think. Bill, I'm laughing at myself because I was thinking back. Yeah, so my first job in the industry, I got hired as an on-air guy on the radio station, and I'm sitting in my seat at a bunch of controls, and I'm potting up and playing records, and I'm talking to the audience in between. And so we flash forward years, decades, and here I am. What am I doing every day? I'm sitting at a set of controls, and I'm talking out loud. I'm on video now, and I'm on the internet, and I'm with office hours across the globe. But is there really that much difference between what I did back then and today? I really think that uh, that Roscoe hit it on the head. I mean, going out and doing things remotes, we used to call them in the radio things, takes more infrastructure, more personnel, and generally is harder to do. You can't really sustain that for 24 hours. And the radio was built on, I did the uh, the 10 a.m., uh, well, I did all sorts of things. My biggest shifts were probably my afternoon drive shifts. So I'd come in and do four hours across going home drive time. And then I'd leave and somebody else would come in and man that same place. And so I think the infrastructure is important to make that efficient for a business. And Sky. Here we are flying above 405 in the car chase capital of the world, Los Angeles. No, the, the helicopters are very expensive. And I noticed that in the... Uh, Nielsen ratings were the way that they would find originally before the, the digital capture of how many eyeballs or earballs are, are listening to your, your content. They, they would put the helicopters up in the air during those points of the year that the Nielsen ratings were saying, and this is how many people you are having listening to your content. Consequently, the sales guys would take those numbers to whomever they were trying to get ads purchased and said, if you market with us, we can reach this many people from our helicopter above 405. Next question. Next one comes to us from John Foltz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. It's strange to see radio stations selling video content and the web. Broadcasters trying to put content on the web and newspapers trying to do both. Everyone wants to do everything. Comments? Go ahead, Roscoe. Well, it, it is an education. Again, I moved to a rural area, and so everybody wants to do everything, but the, the Places where you find information, there's not 150 radio uh, TV stations that I can get to right here. And so it turns out that it's the local radio stations that know when the nightly game's going to be. I, I laugh because I went to a play, I'm in Indiana, but I went to a playoff game and there was a station from the hometown of the visiting team as well as the home team with two separate crews. Now, I, I guarantee you these were all volunteers. Well, no, I actually talked to one guy. They're not all volunteers. But they've got paid two different crews to do a high school basketball game. And that's it. Small town, local is, is where the content is. And as we all know, content is king. And if you have good information, the radio station around here, and to be honest, the newspaper, while I've been here, has gone down from uh, three, week, three times a week down to one time a week publication. Bill? Yeah, follow the eyeballs, follow the ears. If people are stopped not reading newspapers and they're doing something else, you go there if you want to keep your business viable. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. And Courtney? Yeah, what, what Bill said, the number of eyeballs and eardrums determines the price you can charge for your advertising, and most broadcasting is still supported by advertising or sponsorship in some form. Even uh, NPR has their corporate sponsors, which pay for that uh, time. And the more number of... Uh, documented ear eardrums or eyeballs that they can report, the more money they're going to make for their advertising. 
And just to add a cherry on top of that is, as Bill said, like where the eyeballs go, it's how are the people, the audience consuming information. So there are a lot of publications that were slow to, or even radio stations, slow to see the see that this is where people are going. They're, the mobile devices people are not listening to. So it's like, how are people engaging in just in their day to day lives, we always say from a marketing perspective, you know, you're when you're looking at your audience, where do they live, work and play? And you want to show up in those ways. So if it's a matter of them that they are they're listening to podcasts or, OK, so we're going to start creating podcasts. You'll see the the number of net, uh, publications or, or broadcasters that now have podcasts and not only just they started a podcast. Now they've niched with their podcast is like the political one, the all of that. So they just understand the the business of targeting your audience and, and really servicing your audience and how they like to receive communication. Sky. Well, and as we heard Jason say, if we are uh, consuming through the Internet, Google makes their money through ad sales. And so when he says we are their product, it's because they like they're replacing the Nielsen rating concepts in that we have this many eyeballs. And so that's where it's a oftentimes a numbers game if you're doing it for commerce. And Courtney. Yeah, one thing this uh, funny thing happens when you do this cross pollination, when radio sh radio shows then start uh, streaming uh, video cameras from their radio studios. It's always disappointing to uh, see that uh, radio personality that you've listened to for years and they don't look anything like you imagined them to look like. So it's always disappointing. Oh, she's like uh, over 60 and uh, short and kind of, she sounded much taller and leaner on the radio. <laughs> Same thing with the guys. Oh, he's 70 and bald. He sounded like he was an 18 year old when I listened to him broadcast so Gar Garrison it's kind of disappointing when you when you tune in to the see those videos kind of destroys the mystique of radio that you had all these years and, and clive said something similar he said radio um, for me radio lost its magic when they put webcams in the control room theater of the mind died so well just you're not alone courtney next question Dave Troutman, Edmonton, Canada's up next. Did narrow casting for cable audiences bring on the fragmentation of audiences, which we're dealing with on online? Roscoe? Uh, I'd use the word syndication, I think, did it. It didn't necessarily have to be uh, cable, but you, know, you suddenly had small stations and you had uh, content coming from the networks. Um, in 1971, they had to spin off the networks, used to control everything, and they used to, you know, oh, we can only, uh, only certain stations can get my first, I'm trying to think what an old, NYPD Blue, you know, some old TV studio, or 70s, sorry, I'm not old enough, I wasn't, in the 70s, there were shows that they needed to syndicate, and the law changed to where the networks had to make that a third-party operation. They couldn't, it certainly went to who's the highest bidder, and I think that's when the audience uh, started to, you know, mm -hmm fall into smaller and smaller segments. And now we have things, the broadcasters are really no, not even the big players. You have Netflix doing original programming, Amazon does original programming. So a lot of this quote unquote syndication is now already not, not at the broadcasters. Sky? A Graham Kerr did the Gallup and Gourmet out of Canada, but it was the early days of television and these little small stations needed content because they had airtime that they needed to fill in the middle of the day. So he was able to be on ABC and CBS and in and all of the different localized TV stations and consequently got a broad range because it was entertainment in the middle of the day. And that's what they needed. But now what we're seeing is the, the consolidation of a lot of these networks. And so earlier when we were talking about the uh, the hosts well sometimes because there are no local hosts because it's owned by a tribune broadcast or something like that and so it's all created somewhere else and then distributed to these local stations so the fragmentation of of audiences uh i think the the internet's allowing that to happen but i love that that alexander earlier said he's also now being exposed to new uh content through radio stations, and I think the the web is allowing us to do that too, but you need to be open to not just listening to your, I heard this term, you're inside your own echo chamber. There's a big world out there, a lot of fun you haven't explored yet. 
And Courtney? Yeah, I think there's a, a detrimental aspect to narrow casting and that it becomes siloing. Uh, as Guy said, you know, uh, with all these different choices, uh, people can uh, alienate uh, themselves or isolate themselves from other points of view. So you'll get one specific ideology or one specific political party or one point of view on uh, politics or religion or local, you know, uh, uh, local events, etc. And due to that narrow casting, you only listen to that one event and you become closed off to a broader point of view. I kind of liked it better when there was, uh, uh, you know, just three networks out there who had to uh, cater to all points of view at the same time and carefully vetted their news and information and programming to appeal to a broader audience rather than to a narrow audience. And uh, therefore, I think it, it generates... Uh, Narrow casting kind of generates conflict between the different classes, et cetera. So I don't like it because of that. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada says, why do we still separate broadcast from social media or other widespread communications channels? They both serve the same job to be done. Sky? Why do we still call a film a film? We haven't used 35 millimeter celluloid in, in a decade in, in most studios. So I think it's just lexicon language, people getting familiar with, with something they're used to. So um, that's why I think we're exploring what is connection look like in today's world with today's technology. Bill? I will say, yeah, I think Sky's right. It's also the, the entropy in some of these things. I, I had an experience at the beginning of the pandemic. I, I do a lot of content production for broadcast and for other things. And of course, over the top and niche things, Vimeo and things like that are now equally as well, not maybe equally as possible, but they're all viable methods for getting advertising out. I will never forget in the early days of the pandemic, I had some video spots for a client that really needed to get out. And I said, um, we don't have time. We need to get these on the air tomorrow. They have to do with uh, food banks and getting people taken care of as the pandemic's disrupting things. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one version of this on Vimeo Pro, my Vimeo Pro account. If you are a station who can possibly just use this, go there and you can get it in the next 24 hours. And then I went to work on this bespoke encodes for like the NBC station and the CBS station and this weird over the top station. And to my astonishment, 95% of the stations on the buy made the Vimeo thing work and it looked great. Up until that distribution, I had... 18 different presets for sending to specific stations. And what it told me was that most of the confusion was just that entropy. This is the way we've always done it. This is what our broadcast specs have to be. Every station needs its own special thing because their engineers think it needs to be an own, its own special thing. It actually didn't. They just hadn't changed in decades. And they were confronting the fact that everything had changed out from under them in the space of a month and a half. I'll never forget that lesson. And kind of just surmising that it, the semantics, as Sky said, and it really is broadcast still is radio and television. So you understand like that, those formats. Now, if you want to say media, which is now all encompassing of social and just the overall communications, I think that's where um, th that's where it would make more of a difference. But broadcast doesn't need to cross over. They're using elements of of, um, social media in their media, but it itself, it is what it is. Um, Roscoe? Sorry, I had to get the mute off. Um, I drive between here and my mother-in-law's house. It's about an hour away. I have about 20 minutes where I have no internet service. I have no cell service, and uh, but I do have radios. So broadcast still exists. It is still an entity. It is still the way the communication gets out to people, and it does gather together communities. Next question. Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. How are current broadcasters working with the new models of broadcasting, social media, hyperlocal, et cetera, when it seems to be changing yearly, monthly, or weekly? Oliver? Yeah, it seems like they are still experimenting. Um, Saturday night after the uh, meet and greet at the uh, office hours dinner in Las Vegas, I was uh, 
uh, sitting here and I got a notification from YouTube that Saturday Night Live is going to stream their opening monologue live uh, on YouTube. And so I just uh, to to see what it's uh, like, I tuned in and it was interesting that they showed a sort of a mixture between a behind the scenes and the actual um, uh, the actual monologue. So you could see how chaotic it, it seems, you know, when when the cameras are off um or pointing somewhere else and the other thing that i found very interesting is that uh, obviously nobody told them how crappy interlaced video looks on live streams to youtube so you get, got all the shearing and uh kind of things um and uh yeah i think for a while they will still have to experiment and find their way and uh you know uh maybe they do maybe they don't sky well, why fix what ain't broke, right? Because we've invested millions of dollars in a technology and hardware. Our engineer told us that was what was going to make us money and, and, and that ship was going to sail for a long time. And so consequently, these new technologies of things, the, the thing I'm also realizing we haven't even brought into the conversation, where is AI going to fit into it's this new content creation future because when the video engineer that knew where that copper cable was replaced with the IT engineer that is now doing everything on software, um, that was a is a huge transition that um, people have put a lot of money into and trusted. And the again, trust is a huge word when you're selling advertising because you're taking forward and saying, yeah, we're going to promote your your image out there to our audience. So uh, trust. And where does AI fit into that? Courtney? Yeah, I wanted to something, say something on the previous question, but it ties into this question as well, is broadcasters, uh, the availability of news broadcasting versus narrowcasting of social media. And a lot of people draw their news from social media like Facebook or uh, uh, TikTok or, or Twitter. And they just depend on that for their news feed because it's it's crowdsourced, it's immediate, and you may find out about some breaking part, part of news uh, before you will find out before the networks or before the local broadcasters can pick it up. You'll see it first on your, uh, on your social media feed. But the problem with that is that news stream is controlled by an algorithm, and that algorithm is based on your particular preferences. So like I said earlier, you become siloed. Uh, the algorithm is showing you only the news that you're interested in, and you don't get a broader point of view. Whereas broadcasting, there is uh, somebody else that's determining the content and not what what strictly you like to see. It's more like what a broad uh, collection of people like to see. So I think there's a danger in becoming siloed with social using, depending upon social media as your source of news and information. Uh, because the algorithm can can trick you into believing a lot of believing that nobody else uh, you know nobody else's opinion matters only your opinion matters because that's the only thing you see on your social media because you're being served only that kind of news that you agree with. Oliver, well, coming back to the AI question, so a lot of machine learning is already used in video processing, uh, in in photography. And the AI question, uh, coming back to Courtney, I think uh, uh, one of the biggest problems will be the amount of content that's going to be created uh, and uh, it's going to be created by using AI and you don't really know um, what the intention is behind it. So um, it's interesting to see if there's maybe a trend um, that people will go back to more traditional media um, uh, when the social media space is overloaded with all the AI stuff. Um, the question is, uh, if the traditional media is also going to be overloaded with AI generated content. And so you really don't know what to believe anymore in, in this world. And, uh, it, it's going to be interesting how that pans out. Next question. Paul Palmer in Lewis, Delaware says, During a recent Saturday tornado, while WGMD was on automation, I realized I could not get a live announcer on the air from home. I've now set up a recurring Zoom session that I can inject into our station's automation to get local info on the air anytime. Grant? 
I just love that. Necessity is the mother of invention. And I love uh, connecting one communication source with another to then, you know, you create this tra- train and then you get it out. That's awesome. Love it. And Bill? Yeah, one of the things that sent me looking in other directions from radio was the increase of automation and tight programming lists so that there was less and less diversity of all the stations. No matter which market I went into, the the radio stations all sounded the same. They were playing the same playlists because a national coordinator or program director had taken over all of them. And I love the fact that you figured out that too much automation is not very agile. And when something happens and you need to serve your local market, you got to have some way to do that or people will give up on you and they'll never come back. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, what role do you see community college uh, or college radio station playing in the media landscape of the future? Roscoe? Well, colleges uh, uh, go everything from small communities. Some college stations are in small communities, so they'll continue to provide that small community environment. But bottom line, it's about training and bringing people into the industry with some skill set that is marketable that somebody is willing to pay them for when they leave college. Sky? Again, it's, it's not the knife, it's the chef. And consequently, the, the college used to be the barrier to entry for the equipment. Now that Again, we have access to the internet. We have access to communities. Uh, Finding out if you are wanting to be in the media industry uh, is is much lower a barrier, but these local colleges have, some of those uh, colleges have that experience, expertise, and equipment and support of, of the theory, not just the technology. Finding new talent. Next question. Mark Giuliani, Washington, D.C. Do you think you can take a traditional FM news talk station and add a video component? Roscoe? I'm going to say no. I just don't think there's enough demand uh, to... I mean, you can put little snippets in. If you're re- Somebody mentioned, I think Grant said this earlier, if, you're, if your reporter happens to be out there with an iPhone, takes a picture, and you can put it on your website, great. You may make a little revenue off it. Next question. Dave Troutman, Edmonton, Canada, internet radio without advertising has interested me for years. Who has a favorite channel? Jason. For many years, I um, I worked on a comedy station called the No Holds Barred Radio Network. And I don't think it's on the air anymore, but if it is, find it and enjoy it. And Roscoe. KUSC. It's a University of Southern California. KUSC uh, Classical Music. No commercials. Love it. Next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia. We know that host reads, host read ads work. Why is it that we don't see radio personalities take advantage of the trust and relationship they've built to read commercials? Alexander, do you want to share a little more on that briefly? Well, I mean, you just look at the the Leo Laports of the world. Obviously, I mean, I I buy more products when when the host reads the the ad. But when I just hear some dynamic ad insertion or I just hear some commercial that's read by somebody else, I just tune out. I just it's not interesting at all. So I don't know why we don't hear more radio personalities do that. I know Howard Stern does that on on, uh, but he's not on terrestrial radio anymore. Copy that, Bill. Well, there's a certain danger to that, which is that you're trying to build a reputation as being even handed. And, you know, we had this problem when I was writing articles for a major magazine. I couldn't really do any work for any one manufacturer outside of that because I needed to be have the perception, and I was trying to uphold it, of being even handed at looking at all the technology. If you're in one breath promoting uh, Zamke as the best software developer on the planet and uh, the advertiser for any other software thing comes in, you're in the midst of a conflict. People know you're being paid from this one outlet, from this one uh, commercial enterprise. And can you really be even handed in assessing all the other commercial enterprises when one's giving you money, even if it's above board and everybody knows they're paying you for it? It's, it's a challenge. Sky? Graham Kerr referred to the 101 uses that this mop sponsor wanted him to talk about, and he was not interested in being a shill for a, a, a twisty mop thing, as he was a he was a chef. So that was the conflict there. And Oliver. Yeah, so many YouTubers uh, recently found out that some advertisers seem to be too good to be true and are too good to be true. 
And uh, that's that's one one side of the medal. The other side of the medal is as an advertiser, I might want to control the message and uh, uh, not take the risk of the uh, person, you know, screwing up my brand name or something like that. So um, it's it's I think it's you know case by case uh, consideration at the end. Well, we've come to the end of another great office hours, but not officially the end because we will be back with NAB coverage, our team that is on the ground. And that special coverage starts at 10 a.m. PDT to 12 p.m. So you want to come back, go take go take a break for an hour and then come back and join us for the special coverage. But I definitely want to say to all of our producers, thank you so much for your questions. This is probably a conversation we need to revisit with more of the com uh, talk on the innovation and the AI and how all of that is being impacted. To our panelists, thank you so much for your insights and your commentary. And of course, our production team without which this would not be possible. So again, NAB 2023 special coverage will take place. And sorry, I almost forgot to tell you, I'm so excited about like what's happening in an hour that tomorrow we will be talking about graphics at NAB. So that'll be the second hour for tomorrow. But to see the rest of the schedule, head over to officehours.global and we will see you next time. Bye. By the way, you can ask questions in our coverage. So go on to your regular Mukana interface the same way you log in every day just log in and participate i'd love to have you there awesome so much just this is so much more we could unpack we have to bring this conversation back and the money side yes. how are they how that those ads is that going away thoughts sustain terrestrial ready sustainability how is it I buy anything Bill Davis sells. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Which is why I don't sell anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I would have been the guy who was in Bitcoin when it all crashed. <laughs> I would have been the, the face of Bitcoin. <laughs> that would not have been good. That's why I don't we trust have you. a face for crypto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Build the crypto guru. <laughs> That's, that would not have been a good look. See you in an hour. Yeah.